Right. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Alex Bowie, co-director of the BDTK Center's Coordination Center. Uh, welcome to another BDTK Data Science Seminar. So last time we actually concluded Section 3, which provided an overview um, of computing. And we heard about some of the work that NIH is doing in developing cloud-based infrastructure to support biomedical big data science. Today we actually start a new section, Section 4, which is focused on data modeling and inference. And any of you who've had to work with big data data sets will appreciate the challenges that are associated with both understanding the data and using it to uncover patterns. And so over the next few weeks, we'll have speakers talking about a range of techniques that are related to modeling and inference tasks. And to kick off the section, we're joined by Dr. Rafael Irizarry, a professor of biostatistics at Harvard in the School of Public Health and a member of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. His work focuses on genomics and computational biology problems. In particular, he's worked on the analysis of microarray, next generation sequencing, and genomic data. Dr. Rosari has developed several online courses on data analysis that are offered uh, through HarvardX, including data analysis for the life sciences and genomic data analysis. So please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Rosari this morning. Dr. Rosari, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. All right, so a quick overview. Can everybody hear me? Just double checking. Yes? Okay, okay. Yes. All right, great. So uh, as a quick overview, so you know what's coming, I'm going to divide this into two parts. I, I'm going to very quickly review some basic inference and modeling since this is what the lecture is about. But it's uh, what I want to do more than, than, than give introduction, introductory material is to show how I use it in, in my research, uh, to put it in context. Uh, and I'm going to do it. In, I'm going to show two parts: one, somewhat simple inference, basic inference, and then the second one, a little bit more advanced, more complex, related to exploration and modeling, and how it's very important, or how I, I have found it to be very important uh, for understanding and improving the quality of information that comes out of high throughput measurements. So I work in. I've been working for the last 15 years mainly in genomics, uh, with techno with developing statistical methodology for the measurements that come out of new technologies such as microarrays, next generation sequencing, and it's different applications because these technologies have many different applications and for each one different statistical challenges come up. And it's been uh, data science for since I've started. It's The problems are, pr are very much driven by the data. People are using data to discover new things. So, so even before that term became widely popular, uh, people in genomics were, were we're bringing to data science. All right, so there's much more information on my web page of what I want to talk about, and also I make announcements on Twitter about new research papers, new courses, uh, and other things. So here's a course that was, here's a link to the course that was described. This, is, this one is, uh, it's, it's free, it's a free course. You can, you can take it self-paced. There's, there's currently seven different courses that go in order of difficulty, starting with the simplest one where introductory statistics uh, is, is uh, presented along with R code to be able to implement the, that, that knowledge. Uh, there's also a book that goes along with that, with that course. It's also free. You can get it on, on, on LeanPub. Uh, and it's, it comes down as a PDF. If you want a hard copy, you can, that's not free. And it's, it's, you can get it on Amazon. And one nice thing about the book is that it, it basically reconstructs the, the code. You, you need to reconstruct the book with all the data analysis in it is included on, on GitHub, there's links to it in, within the book. So you can not only read it and learn statistics and, and computing and, and coding in R, but also recreate the book and learn that way. All right, so just to, to get started, I want to go back to the very, very small, the most simplest uh, concept in inference. And those that already know this, bear with me, it'll only be like five minutes. And basically, it, it's what I'm going to do is explain what the little stars on top of the buildings with antenna that we see in, in, in scientific papers means, right? So that's what they put on 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 the, on the graph to to the, to relay that it's statistically significant. So I'm going to just go over that for five minutes and then explain some some subtleties that how that, this has come up in in my research. So to 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 give a very simple example, let's suppose we have two groups and uh, basically, just to, to make it simple, I'm going to use men and women in heights. And uh, what I have is a population of of men and women. And there's a there's if you can take the mean of the men and the mean of the women, and and that 
that those two means may or may not be different. Let's suppose we don't know. We come from outer space and we don't know that that's the case. Uh, so we want to know, and we could just measure everybody and, and, and come up with an answer, uh, or we could uh, take a sample. So if we take a sample of 10 people, for, of 10 of each, we then get data. So here's what it would look like. Here's an example of a sample. This is an actual sample that I took from with using uh, pre pre uh, uh, measured heights, and we can see that there's a difference between men and women. Men are taller by three inches in this sample. So inference is the a part of statistics that helps you understand if this is uh, it, it, how much can this vary, and if it if, and how consistent this is with the with the actual means being the same or different. So we basically are interested in the means of the population, so we look at the sample means and, and then use that to, to try to answer the question. So here's what, one way to, to, to see inference, to understand inference. So we did it once, so I'm, I'm just going to do it for the men heights, not for the difference for now. So we, the, 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 uh, the, import, the important concept to, to get here is that every time we take a sample, the mean changes, here's the mean of men for the first sample I took, but if I take another one, it'll be a different one. I'm going to start making a histogram where these heights pile up, and you see that we get different values every time, and we do it a, a million times. Uh, we we ev and eventually get a, a distribution of uh, of the heights, uh, so of the average heights, and we can see how much it varies. It varies uh, from around 67 to about 71. That's where 95% of the data is of the, of the outcomes are. And this gives us this tells us, wait a minute, we saw a difference, but they could it could have been different. How different could it have been? Well, this distribution helped us understand that. And that's kind of the, the general principle behind inference. But understanding that the population has a has variability and that there's there's tall men and short men, et cetera. And the fact that we take a sample results in the average heights having uh, variability as well. So if we if we make the sample bigger, this is one of the things you learn in statistics classes, then the variance of that mean gets smaller. Right? So you can see that this distribution is not as fat. So this is what you learn in statistics classes, that that mean and those means, both for men and women, is going to be approximately normal with the population mean, standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And what this, the way we use this in biology very often is, is by constructing a t-statistic. And we can do, using some mathematics, we model, when some model, and we, we, we know how much that t statistic should vary just by chance, and from there we get p values and confidence in all of this data. So that's just a reminder of what, what we're talking about here. Uh, well, sometimes we don't assume normality, we use a model and assume the t distribution. I'm not getting into that here. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you an example of how that simple concept has. It, it, uh, and it, this was a, a research activity of mine a long time ago, and this it actually keeps coming up, but uh, how that concept was not was not being clearly understood by collaborators, and other people publishing papers, and we uh, we did a little experiment to kind of point out the problem. So I'm going to give you an example, and it relates to this: the decision sometimes is made by biologists or experimental biologists to pool their samples to reduce variance. Okay, so here's an experimental design that is is very common in in biology and if we, well, let's say now let's talk about gene expression. That's one of the topics that I work in. So we're, we have a microarray and we're going to get gene expression for 12,000 genes. So we're, we get, for each gene, we get 12 measurements. Now I'm going to just focus the discussion on if we, if we had just one gene or two genes. Uh, we, we get, we have a, a, a several mice. So we want, we want to get, what we want to find out is if a gene is differentially explained and explicit in two different strains. So we, we follow the procedure we just talked about with the heights. We get 12 mice of each strain. We're going to measure the gene expression for a given gene and then try to answer that question. So if we say yes, if we say yes, this gene is differentially expressed, then that what we're saying is if you do this experiment in your lab, you will also see it be different. That's kind of what we're saying. So, uh, the, but there was some, there was a, many of my collaborators were doing something that actually kept them from answering that question. How is that the case? Because they pooled the data, they pooled the data from the 12 mice, and then they created four technical replicas. But when I asked why, I would say because that reduces the variance. Okay, now that's, if you're, if you're doing that, that means you don't understand statistical inference, and I'm going to explain why that is. So, 
So you, 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 this is the experimental design. We take 12 measurements from 12 mice, pool them, and then create four replicates of the pool. So we're, once you do that, you will not see the variability across the mice. So in the case of the, imagine if you're doing this with heights, that would be taking 10 men, measuring their height, uh, uh, taking a, t measuring their heights 10 times, and then reporting the average of the 10 four times. So if you just presented this to someone who didn't know anything about heights, they would think that there's no tall man and short man, it's just one man, and there's a little bit of measurement error when we measure that, when, when, we, when we measure that. So here's, here's an example. This is not a cartoon, this is real, this is data from the experiment of one of the genes, of two of the genes in the microarray. These are two genes that when they look at, the, they compare the two groups, the two replicated, the, the, the two pairs of four replicates that were coming from technical replicates, these four and four, that's how you see four points, four and four. We get these two genes with very, very small p-values. The chance of seeing something like this by chance using this t statistic we just described is very, very small. It's definitely significant. Both genes are like that. So we write, we write a paper and we say these two are different express. But now we get, it, if, if, if someone else runs this experiment, are they going to see this again when they do it? And the answer is we actually don't know. Why not? Because now I'm going to show you the original data. Now I'm going to show you this. This is actually an experiment we ran to kind of make this point. So what the, uh, we're, I'm actually going to show you this data because in the experiment we ran, we actually got, kept both. We, get, we kept these 12 measurements, these 12 measurements, these four, and these four. So now look at those two genes. So that is now telling a very different story. The first gene has a lot of variability, and the second one has a very, has less variability. This is a much, we would say it's more consistent. So he, now when I look, do it like this, only the one, the second gene has a significant uh, p-value. The first one doesn't. So if someone ran this experiment again, they would actually not confirm gene one, but they probably will, if they have enough power, they'll probably will confirm gene two. So the, the lesson here is you, 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 you want to see the variation because it's for the inference you're doing, it is important. It's, 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 it's part of the, 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 the structure, the, it's part of the framework of inference that you do for, for, for this. And now, we're, we're um, you know, this is something that comes up over and over again where, where the variability that's important to inference is, is, under, is not understood and, you know, many mistakes are made because of that, that uh, error. So here are the two genes next to each other. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's another example, I think, of two genes that are like that where one is very consistent, what the other one isn't, but when you pull, you don't, you don't really get to see that. And we actually wrote a paper on this. It's not just about this. It has other things like experiment. It's about experimental designs when you when you want when you need to pull. This. But in a case, it actually explains this in more detail, and it's published in, in 2005 in PNAS. Okay. So the 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 moral one of the morals of the story of that particular uh, example is that the bi biological variability is much more. It's much bigger than technical variability. And that's, I think that's going to be common in many, many of the measurement technologies that we, we, we have in big, in big data and in biology in general, that we're going to get more and more precise technical measurements, but human variability or whatever we're measuring will, will, won't go away. Okay, so one last, another thing I, I, I would like to mention in a class about inference, in a, in a talk about inference, is the multiple comparison problem. The, this is obvious to most, but I still see papers coming out that do not uh, correct for multiple comparisons in any way. And so I want to just briefly mention it. So just, to, uh, I, just I guess I just won't really use these slides. As, uh, and I'll just describe the problem. When you have, in the case of, uh, of gene expression, you have uh, 12, uh, many, high throughput, sorry, in the case of high throughput technology, we are and we're trying to find, say, differential expression, differentially expressed genes. It could be other things. It could be differentially methylated CPGs. It could be differentially binding transcription factor binding sites, etc. We're looking at many, many. Uh, we're exploring a, a big space. We're testing many hypotheses. That's how a statistician would say it. And one thing to keep in mind is that if you test 10,000 hypotheses and you restrict the the genes you report or whatever units you report to 5%, uh, 
p value, you're going to get 500 incorrect uh, report reported genes, even when when sorry when the, the null hypothesis is true. So if you uh, if you don't understand, if you pro many of you probably are thinking, yeah, I know that, but if you if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about here, definitely go read up on multiple comparison. Our, we have a course that covers it. We have it's in the book, but there's many other books and other courses that, that describe it. All right, all right. So that's the first part of the, of the talk. It and it's. I know it was very basic. Now I want to go to, to some more complicated topics, the complex topics where statistical modeling has helped, and, and also exploratory data analysis, which is, I know it's not in the title of the talk, but it's as important or perhaps more important, uh, in, I think, in, in the analysis of what today we're calling big data. And I'll, I'll do it through examples uh, in the second part. Okay. So the first thing I want to uh, I want to warn against is this the the our 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 desire for wanting to have workflows. This is a screenshot of what you get on Google Images when you Google workflows and in biology or in, in in biomedical sciences. And it is, you know you get a bunch of things like this. But if you if you if you look at them closely, many of them are, are basically come down to a, a workflow like this, describing a way to go from big data to knowledge, right? That's the uh, title of the grant. So you start with big data and then you, you go through this process, you see use of boxes, and at the end there's some, there's some list or, or, or some figure and, and, you're, and, you, and you're done, right? You, you discover something or learn something. So, so what I want to remind so one of the, one of my goals here is to remind listeners of how important it is to think hard about what these boxes are doing, and sometimes just make sure that they're doing what we think we're doing. Uh, it, it, it's many times the case that the the procedures that we think are standard procedures, and we can just stick in it, stick them into the to the workflow, will work. And it turns out that just by looking at a few plots, you quickly realize that it it's absolutely not the case. That we that this that this actually leads to knowledge instead it leads to false positives and confusion. So what I want to do is I want to explain examples of where this the workflow that people were using without exploring data just by kind of just turning the crank uh, what were leading to to problems. All right, so here's a quote from John Tukey uh, that kind of relates to to what I just described. All right, so I, to, to motivate this, I want to, I also want to motivate the, the, the improvement of the, of the boxes in the workflow, not just, to say, not just saying we're going to keep you from making mistakes, but we actually want to help you make discoveries. It's not just about being a, you know, a policeman or about being a, a Debbie Downer about, about what people find, but rather two things. You'll, you'll have less, less false positives, but also you will have more true positives, hopefully. So, so to, 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 make, to motivate that, I, I always like to go back to the discovery of the microscope, which led, not the discovery of the microscope, the improvement of the microscope, which led the person who, who first improved the microscope in, enough, let, it led him to become the father of microbiology. So simply by, by no, not simply, but, he, but when people were looking through the microscopes, other scientists were, were trying to discover things, but they were seeing blurry images, he improved the microscope, and he was able to see something that nobody else saw. And now he discovers microbes. He discovered many, many other things that are microscopic, because he was the only one that could see them. So in, in, high, in my field, in, in high throughput biology, I feel like the data scientists are often not just keeping people from making false claims, but also helping people put their data into focus and make, and make discoveries. So here's another quote from Tukey. Uh, related to that particular uh, topic, and it, it goes to it, it, when it comes to data, which is what we we look at now. We don't look through microscopes anymore, although some people do. We look at data. We have digital data that the the data scientists turn into images that then biologists or or other scientists uh, turn into knowledge or extract knowledge from. And and making figures is exploring data is a key component of doing that uh, properly. 
So I'll give you now concrete examples from my own research related to this, to, to, this, what, I, to what I just described. I'm going to talk about two problems, two, two examples, and uh, there's many more which I won't have time to talk about. If you want to read more about my, my own personal experience in this, I have, you know, a lot of my current papers relate to, to this particular topic, and you're, of course, welcome to, to go look some of those up. Uh, and, I, and I think it's happening all over the sciences. It's not just in genomics. It's not just in biology. But improvement of, of data analysis pipelines by careful data exploration and, and thinking of how to properly model data is, is leading to, to a lot of improvements in, in, um, in how we interpret data. Okay, so here's an example. This is, again, not a cartoon. This is actual, data, this is actual data, experimental data. I'll explain what it is now. So, the, the data that I'm presenting in this plot comes from public repositories. It's this particular one is the Gene Expression Omnibus. And this is a great resource. It has uh, all, any published gene expression experiment is, is supposed to be in, in either GEO or another or in a European database called ArrayExpress. So you can go there. And I, what I did for this one is I went there and I got data from five different tissues. So there's five different tissues represented in this, in this figure. And I obtained gene expression data from them, from, from microarrays in this case. And they are, so that means I have, uh, for each sample, I have 12,000 uh, measurements. So it's a 12,000 number vector. And I have more than five points because for each tissue, I had several individuals. So there's about 50 points because for each tissue, about, I have about 10 people on average. So, so I have these vectors. I have, I have about 50 vectors that are in 10,000 plus dimensions, right? Because I have one number for each gene. So that's something I can't really plot. So instead, I'm going to plot the first two principal components. That's what I'm showing here of that big matrix. If you don't know what principal components are, here's a very, very simple explanation of one of the things you can do with them. So you have each point here represents one of the samples that is originally 12,000 dimensions. I have reduced it to two dimensions, those 12,000. And the nice property about these particular, this particular summary is that the distance between any two points resembles the distance between the original 12,000 uh, dimension vector. So, so, so now when I have it in two dimensions, I can actually see what's close and what's not close. So in this plot, I can see that these points are close. And then we have that these points are close, these points are close, etc. So these points are close. So are that I would tend to think, well, those are probably from the same tissues. Different tissues have different gene expression patterns. That's one of the reasons they they become different tissues in the first place. So I should see here five clusters. I don't quite see them. Uh, now I'm going to reveal what the tissues are, and you can see that it's not really what we were expecting. Right, so these guys that were close together are different tissues. These are colon and these are placenta. And we have some colons down here that are way farther from these colons than they are from here. Right, so you can see other problems in the data. So I would say that this data is out of focus or this fact that we thought we knew about gene expression in tissues is maybe not true. So if you just go down the pipeline, the workflow, and run this data through it and, 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 make, and, and ask for clusters, you conclude Biologists are wrong. Gene expression between tissues is not that different. And that would be a mistake. So because if we then if dig deeper into the data, forget the workflow, let's go back to the data and dig deeper into it, we're going to find that there's a lot of noise in, in the measurement. So now we're going to take one point, just, and we're, instead of just reducing it to, to the two dimensions, we're actually going to look at all the data, all the 12,000 points. And this figure shows you that. Uh, it shows you, so now we have the 12,000 points. You can see there's 12,000 little black dots. And the plot is, is made in, in a way that sh reveals what we are interested in when we look at, compare two samples to see how, what's, what genes are different and what, which ones are not. We have the log ratio of the two measurements on the y-axis. So for example, this gene is 16, it's log base 2. This gene is 16 times bigger on one, one the, one sample compared to the other, right? And th these in, that are at zero are the same. The log ratio is zero. Okay, so 
This particular data set is is not one of the ones that you just saw. This is an uh, this is from an experiment that that a, that a company ran, and we were and they were nice enough to share it with us, just to test out the technology. And what's what was done for this experiment was they took each G, they took two samples that that were the same. How do they know they were the same? Because they took they took one RNA sample, one 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 big of out of 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 uh, material that had RNA molecules in it and they randomly split it into two, they just split it into two equal parts and then they ran the experiment on those two. So if the technology is working well, there's enough molecules there that, that things were at, will, will average out and, and it should be the case that when we compare them, when we, run a, when we measure gene expression in these two, it's basically the same sample, we should get the same answer for every gene. So this mass of points should really be around zero, close to zero. Now you can say, well, sure, there's measurement error. Okay, that's, that's very possible. However, the, the people who ran this experiment included 12, uh, 16 genes. These are the orange ones. They're represented in orange here, where they knew they were actually different. They made them twice as big for real. For real. They actually artificially made them twice as big in one sample compared to the other. So these 12, these 12 points, are the ones that should be different. The black point should be at zero, and these black points should be at one. So this gives you an idea of what signal looks like, and here, this is a problem now. If the signal is this big, then this is a problem. Because if I gave you this picture and I said, find me the 20 most differential genes, you would probably say, well, this one, and that one, and this one, and these, these are all big. You would never come down to this, to these, tw to these 16. So there's a lot of noise in the data. So why is that? Why is there so much noise in the data? Is it is it is this just the way biology is, or is this the way that, um, that the technology works? And if it doesn't, we might as well stop buying this product. Well, so to to answer this question, one of the things we did was go even one step further down the data. These points actually are come from even raw data, and we read how that was done, how they actually got to here, and we noticed that there was some, some modeling going on. There was statistical modeling happening when, when, they, when they analyzed the data to get to these points. So here's, here's sort of what the model was uh, for doing this. So what, what was happening is that these measurements, the, the manufacturers realized that when they, they were trying to measure the expression of a specific gene, they were, they were also measuring background noise. So even when a gene was not expressed, the unit that was measuring that gene would show, would give values, big values sometimes. And they also noticed that different measurement units produced different background levels, which was a problem because now when you have different gene expression measurements in two different genes, it might be, the only reason you might be seeing that is because you were uh, just had two units that w worked that way. One measured high background, the other measured low background. So they they thought of it like this. The model they thought about was like this. You had you wanted to estimate gene expression here represented with a beta, but there's background that's represented with the alpha. And every single measurement, every single different measurement unit had a different alpha. So, to, so it wasn't like a global alpha they can remove. You had to remove an alpha for each single measurement. Every unit had a different one. Every measurement unit had a different one. So to, to get to that out, so if you just see, if you see, what, if you see your measurement is seven, you don't know if that's four plus three or two plus five. You have no way of knowing that. So to, to determine that, what they did was they said, let's construct, let's add measurement units to, the, to this instrument that measures just the background. So now we have we have two measurements. One measures the background plus the signal, the other one just measures the background. And what we'll do then is we'll subtract it and we'll get B. And we're done. So problem solved. But here's a problem with that model. If you take, we, we did another experiment just to, to get an idea of how, how off this model was. Because the, the problem here is that there's no st stochasticity described in the model. So we said that we, we ran an experiment where there, we knew there was no beta. We ran an experiment that was just a negative control. And in that case, we should just be seeing alpha and alpha. So here's a plot of that. And you can see that it's not right on the line. It's, it's correlated. That's good. But it's uh, 
quite a bit of noise. This is in the log scale, so that's quite a bit of noise that you're seeing there between between y1 and y2 measure y2 and y2 y1 and y2's measurement of alpha. So the problem with this is that the actual model should look something like this instead. So now we're now this is actually a statistical model where there's randomness included. So we have alpha one, alpha two, not just alpha and alpha, they're different, they're different quantities. They're correlated in the log scale, the correlation is about 0.7. You can see that's the correlation there is about 0.7. So if that's the case, if the correlate if that's a model, that's a model that to us makes more sense, that implies that if you then look at things like log ratios, which is what people were using to 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 quantify differences in gene expression, then the the variance of that of the log of that difference, right? Because that, that's what they're they're using as a measurement, the difference between one y and y two. The variance of the log of that difference, we can show mathematically, I'm not going to show you here, it's using something called Taylor expansion. It's not important. We can show that that variance is proportional to the reciprocal of the signal squared. That's mathematics. That's not biology. That's not problems with the technology. It's the problem with the decision they made, the mathematical decision they made of how to correct this measurement. So if you look at this, this formula, then you can see that, that you see it here. If you, if you draw a line of, of the variance here, you just go by the points. If you draw a line of the variance, it would go like that. That is that function is one over x squared. Well, it could be some 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 constant. We would need some constant, but it's very consistent with what the math is predicting. One over b squared, one over b squared. This would be b, right? This is the signal average. The average of the of the two measurements is an approximation of the signal. So that that in mind, now that we if we have a now that we have a model, we can come up with a better statistical solution that doesn't have this property. We can do that. We have a model in place. Now we can do math and figure out, okay, what transformation of the data would estimate beta without having a massive variance. And we might introduce a little bit of bias just to reduce the variance. That's one approach that is often used in statistics. In, in machine learning, that's called shrinkage or, or regularization. Uh, and when we do that, with that, with, with, with that in mind, we can construct a, a, a solution based on the model and we can go from this plot to this plot. That's without any new experiment or any kind of, new, nothing new, just the same data processed differently. We get rid of all that noise that we were seeing earlier and now, if we ask you to give me the biggest differences, you would definitely start with some of these orange points. So that's quite a big improvement. So that, again, that was just the result of the changing the way you model the data and develop statistical solutions for it. So that, that idea was turned into software and, and, now, and now today, when people use these technologies, most, not, still not everybody, but most, I would say, use a technique like this rather than, than the, the was originally proposed. All right, so that's uh, one example of how uh, statistical models can improve measurement data that you then use to, to make this biological discovery. For example, let's go back to the, to the, motivation, to the motivation example. Here are the, the data that we, we started with, which I would say is really out of focus data. And this is processed with the original algorithm. Once I use this new idea, this, this new idea that comes from, from a more uh, rigorous statistical model, you end up with a plot that looks like this. And that is now much more consistent with what, what biologists told us. Gene expression patterns from the same tissue are similar to each other and they're different from different tissues. We see the five clusters very clearly. If we didn't know that, we would actually discover it because if you looked at this data without the colors, you would be pretty sure there's four, maybe five clusters and, and you would be on to some. All right, so now uh, moving on to a a, another way in which statistical modeling helps us, quite different. I, I like to talk about this one because it's, I think currently the biggest challenge in genomics is dealing with what, what, I, what we call the batch effect. And I suspect we're gonna see batch effects in pretty much any kind of measurement technology that is uh, collected across time. And you'll see what I mean as I, as I describe this. Okay, so 
I'm going to use an example. This is a paper that used the, used the standard workflow. They took, they, they followed all the best practices. They, they had raw data. They processed it with the, 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 the recommended processing algorithm. They did t-tests correctly. Then they did Bonferroni correction, so they dealt with a multiple comparison problem in a very conservative way. And even after that, they, they report, even after that conservative uh, use of Bonferroni to, to, to not make uh, type 1 errors, they, they conclude that 1,097 of the 4,197 views that they tested show a statistically significant difference between two different ethnic groups when you measure gene expression in blood. So that is, that's a big number. It's contrary to what most people would think was the case. I think if you ask somebody before this paper was published how, how many genes are differentially expressed between two ethnic groups, uh, they would probably say between zero and maybe five. That's, like, that's what I would have answered. Instead, they get a thousand. So they got their paper published in a in a very uh, prominent statistical journal, uh, biological journal, because it's a surprising result. All right. So now let's forget the workflow and let's go back to the data and look at it. So I you can you can actually get this data from Geo. This is the data from that paper. You can see there's about 200 points, 209, I think. So each point now, does, it's not a different tissue, each point is a different person. And, I, and each person has a, has a profile of, they, they say out of 4,000, but I think the original number was 8,000 that they filter, filtered down. So this is a technology that measured about 8,000 gene express, genes, expressing for 8,000 genes. So we have, a ve for each person, you have a vector of about 8,000 uh, and I, uh, and then I, we reduce it down to two for PCA just to take a look, first look at the data. And we can see that the result here is very consistent with what they were saying about 1,000 genes being different because there's a very clear difference between the two ethnic groups being compared. You have the orange and it compared against the green. The first principal component is very different. That, that would probably, that, that to me is very consistent with, the, with, what, they published, with what was published. Now, if looking at this data, there's something else that catches our eye, and it's that we see other clusters, not just the ethnic groups. If you look closely at the orange group, which is all the same ethnic group, you see, I see at least, I see a cluster here and a cluster here. And then I move here, there's another cluster here, and you can kind of see another one here. So, but regardless of that, if, if this group is shows this much variation. Why is this group showing this much variation? That's a lot more. That's double or triple. So when, when you see a picture like that, you start wondering what else could be explained as difference. And in, in this case, there's a group of scientists. It wasn't, it wasn't my group. It was another group that, that decided to, to note it. I don't know how they originally noted this, but they noted that these samples were processed across five or six years. And it turns out that when you get the raw data for, for this, you can actually get the state. It's actually stamped on the file where the data lives. And when you plot, now I'm going to show you the same plot. Points aren't going to move. All I'm going to do is change the color to represent date, year, instead of ethnic group. OK, so now when I do that, I can see that th those two clusters that I, that I kind of could see before, right here and here, one's greenish and the other one's orange. That's 2002, and this is 2003. So that's the, that was the moment in which this, the, the measurements were made, not when the people were born or, or anything like that. It's just technical. Then we see 2004 here, 2005, 2006. So is, it, is, the, is this variability that we see described by, by, is it really just the date, the batch? Is, we call them batch effects because these are things that were processed in batches. It wasn't just done once. So this particular experiment is it's a little bit hard to distinguish between ethnicity and date because it's confounded. If you go back and forth, you see that the, the, the orange points coincide with the green and orange here, and that the, the green coincide with the uh, pink. So there were 
basically done in different years. So when you compare two things, it's hard to tell. Is it year or is it uh, ethnicity? Now, to, the, what you can do more, more data exploration. And if you do, I think you'll be convinced that it's probably date what's, what's, what's making this so variable. Uh, here's one example. This is the first principal component stratified. Now I'm going further. Instead of year, I'm doing it by month. So this is one ethnic group here, all these orange ones. And you can see that the first principal component drops dramatically in uh, February of 2003. And then it drops again in uh, April. And then it kind of stays there. So maybe they were bu buying boxes of the whatever. We don't know what it was, but you can definitely see that there's, there's a big change within the group which is explained by month. So when, you, when I see a picture like this, I, I say, well, I'm going to have to, I want, I want to do this experiment again. I'm going to balance everything and, and see if I get a different answer. All right, so now let's explain this with, with inference and statistical modeling, this batch effect, which is ubiquitous in, in high throughput technology measurements and beyond. One thing I should mention is we, as an aside, we can see the batch effect very clearly in high throughput technology. In low throughput technologies, it's not always obvious, but it's, it's harder to see if it is there. So in a way, high throughput technologies may be being negatively affected because of the fact that they reveal something. Because they're more informative, you actually can see the problems. When it's not as informal, it's low proof, or you actually, it might be there, but you don't see it. So don't think this is just a problem with high throughput data. It's just that we can see it with high throughput data. I'm going to give you an example of, of, of a low throughput experiment that had a huge batch effect in a second. All right, so here's, here's the general, just to write it down with, with the inference model, with the, with the statistical modeling approach of why this is a problem. And, it's, and I'm going to write it in more general terms. So I, I, I'm interested in the difference between two groups. In this case, it was two ethnic groups, but it could be something else. I, we earlier did two strains of mice, and before that, we did uh, two sexes or genders. Uh, so you have two groups, group one and group two. And we're going to take several measurements for each one. We're going to take several individuals from each one. So that's what the I is indexing. So we have several measurements for one, several measurements for two. And what I am assuming is that, or, or the way I'm modeling this is that there's a mean, there's a mean value for that group, alpha. And then there's differences between individuals, which are described with this term here. This is sometimes called measurement error, but in the case of heights or, or gene expression, it's, it's, other, it's other things. It's not just measurement error. In the case of heights, it's some people are tall, so they have a big L epsilon. Some people are short, so they have a negative epsilon. OK, then the second group has, has the same mean. And perhaps, that's what we're going to test, it has a difference that is parametrized with the beta. And then they also have measurement error. So what I'm looking for, I'm looking for genes, or, or in, the, in, the, in the previous case, I was looking for genes that had betas different from zero and reporting those. All right, so how do I find beta? We already went over this, but here we go again. We, 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 the difference between the two means of the two groups is going to be approximately beta. The alphas cancel out. The L epsilons average out to zero if we take enough measurements. So this is approximately beta. And what we did with the t-test is to go further and say, well, it's beta. But we also know that it has a standard error, which has to do with the population variance and the size of the sample. Well, that's the standard statistical approach to doing this. But, and that's what that was done for this, this previous example we talked about when they were looking for genes that were different in the two groups. Now, when you have a batch effect, that model is no longer correct. Instead, and, in, and here I'm, I'm, I'm showing an example where the batch effect was confounded, meaning that group one had, was done in one batch Group two was done in another batch. So this, this W that I'm showing you here is the potential difference introduced by being in a different batch. Note that there's no I. So each batch has its own mean value. So if I have this, if, if this is my correct model, then I have a problem because this is no longer the case. I no longer, the alphas, um, 
wait, okay, the, 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 I, this should be alpha, sorry, this guy here. The alphas no longer cancel out. The epsilons might, I'm sorry, the alphas do cancel out. The epsilons are, still average out to zero, but these w's, they stay. So what, what I'm, when, when, I, when I look at the difference in the average, what I'm seeing is the, what I'm, the difference I'm interested in plus the difference in the, in the average values introduced by the batches. So if I look at these differences and I see a 5, I don't know if it's 2 plus 3 or 0 plus 5 or, or 5 plus 0. I have no way of, of distinguishing that. I, can't, I have no information. I have no way of separating that out when it's completely confounded. So that's, that's, the, that's the problem with, conf, with, with the confounding batches with, with outcomes. And that hap unfortunately, that happens a lot in these experiments where they get all the controls and they run them first and then they get all the treatments and run a second. I see it all the time, this, this, this type of confounding. The, another way to think, to think about this, for those that are more advanced statistically, is to think that these Ws are random variables. So it's like a random effect that, that each batch introduces. It's 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 uh, it's the same across across batches. So the way that th this is then turns into into uh, a description of the problem is that the variance that we estimated for our estimate is bigger. There's a variance due to W than what we actually use for a t test, which is this, this component. So when we construct a t test with this variance, we're underestimating the variance, and therefore we get our t tests are bigger than they should. That's another way to think about this. Okay, so here's an example. Just to, earlier, I said this is not this is not specific to high throughput. Here's, here's an example from physics experiments uh, from the last century. So what this this is data from from that that you can get from a paper that published in Technometrics by Uden in 1972. He actually has a table of these values, and I turned them into a figure, and they are the reported estimates of the astronomical unit. Uh, along with a confidence interval. So this is what today we think is the astronomical unit. It's, it's, it's shown here in, 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 in this, with this dashed line. And here is the first experiment that, that, that's, that, or at least in this paper, was reported. And then here's the second one. And we can see that the speed of light, either, either there's, a pro there's something wrong with either the estimates of the confidence intervals or the speed of light changed in, in, in 1900. And you can see it happen again, right? Because th this is definitely statistically significant. Here's a, it again. It changed again in 1920. The pseudo light changed, etc. So that is um, a problem. And if we just looked at this guy with no other information, we wouldn't know what's going on. But once we make the whole plot, this is the, now we turned it into a high throughput experiment with many labs measuring it. Uh, we see the problem, and it's that there's like there's a lab effect. It's a batch effect, depending what lab did it we get a, 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 a deviation from what today is considered to be the right answer. So the, the problem is the lab that we're measuring these, within their lab, they can't see that they have this batch effect. So the, the confidence intervals that they report are much smaller than what they should be. So here's, here's another way to think about it. This, this variance that we see here, this variance that we see here is estimated with as a measurement error variance, so we get it from within the experiment, that would be the variance of the measurement error, while the, the batch effect variance, W, is much bigger. That's why the points are varying all over the place. All right, so um, I, 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 there, there are some solutions that have been developed for this problem. They are, they're based on something called factor analysis. It uh, is actually a, a very old technique from the 1900s and early 1900s. And, and the reason that, that this technique is, is widely used is because when we look at the data, this is, this is a, a plot of the correlations between the 200 individuals from the uh, previous example. And you can see that there's, there's blocks of, of groups that are more correlated to each other. Right, so this, this must be like the first two years, this, this, and this is like 2005. You can see these blocks of time, but then there's a sub-block. There's all this structure. You see like tight red dots, not as tight, but somewhat pinkish, big squares. So, so there's a structure in the data that makes, it's, that, that, makes, that is induced by some kind of weird grouping 
that has to do with date, but it's not clear that it's just date. Uh, so when you have a problem like that, factor analysis, what it tries to estimate this structure and, and then take it into account when you're doing the analysis. So I'm, I'm going to try to explain that in five minutes so we can finish with five minutes for questions. And to, to describe this approach and give you an idea of how, how complex this is, I'm going to use a, a subset of the earlier data set of 200 people. I'm going to take 24 of them. I'm going to take 12 men and 12 12 females and 12 males, right? So, so, so here you can see the experimental design here. I'm going to confound date, but not completely. So these techniques work when date is, if, if something's completely confounded, we're, we're, I, we currently don't have any, any solutions. But if it's not, there's, you can use statistical models to help. So here is a, here's, you can see the confounding here. More males were measured in June than, than females, and more females were measured in October than males. All right, so this plot is, this is not a cartoon. This is, again, actual data from the, from the experimental data. Uh, you can see genes. I have selected some genes. I didn't, I'm not showing you all 8,000. And you can see the, the y-axis up here, the y, sorry, the y uh, chromosome up here. These are genes on the y chromosome. Males are high. Females are low, because females don't have a y chromosome. All right, so that, there are the 12 men and the 12 women. and 12 males, 12 females, and, and then this is, these are genes on the Y chromosome. Then we see other genes, and there's no difference. You know, you can see some variability. And then down here, you can see the dates. These are genes that are affected by the batch effect. So let's look at that. So can you tell where June is? You can see it here. See this square here? There's nine people here, nine men. These nine men that were done in June, they're right here. And then these three, these three men, I'm sorry, these three men, they're right here. They're blue. So you see October and June. Octo uh, this is June and October. Right? The, for the females, there's three in June and nine in October. So you can see the batch effect. So what happens if I do a t-test now, just ignoring this? If I compare this side to that side, these are going to be super significant. But so are these, because there's more red here than over here. So if I, if, I, if I fit, this is a model, this is another way of writing out the t-test model. If I assume this, I get, uh, this, this area is going to cause problems for me. If I make a histogram of p-values, I get a lot of significant genes. Main, when I look at the autosome genes, I'm really not expecting many or any at all. And I, um, it's driven probably by the fact that we have the difference between June and October. So. You can, see, you can see the sample correlations again here. So here's, or, here's the original ordering with ma male, uh, females and males ordered right like that. The correlation is not explained by it. It's, it's explained by date. So if I, if I order them by date, you can see June and October. So there's two big red boxes. There's more correlation in, in, in the ones within October, more correlation in the ones in June. But we can't just model it as June and October because there's sub Groups. So there's another subgroup here that apparently ended in October 23 or right before or in the morning of October to, oh, June 23, and then it stops, and then there's another little box here. You can see some tiny, so it's basically what I'm saying is it's not as simple as just dates. There's some other thing going on. What factor analysis does is it try to estimate the structure. So what we do is we add a, another component. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a linear component. For those that know what, what I mean by that. And it, it basically tries to model this structure with a linear model where you're actually estimating the, the, uh, the matrix that describes the variability. Well, so this is a little more complicated. It's, it's PCA works for estimating these components. And, and that's what basically factor analysis does. What's new? What's new? And what the reason there's publications in 2007, as opposed to just saying let's just use factor analysis, because we have we have to now distinguish between finding, being a model. We have to model the the part that has to do with the biology that we care about. So we want to estimate the difference between uh, males and females. So we include that that we don't want that to just be thrown into the factor part. And then we model this part down here with a, with a factor model. And then estimating and fitting this model is, is complicated. And there, that's why there's publications, because there's different approaches for doing this. And 
different techniques. Uh, there are several there are several papers. But here's here's a, a, the result of applying one of them. Know that now the this this is now flattened out. That's good. It means it removed most of the genes that we think were due to the batch effect. That's what happens when you you apply this model to this data. So we we, we reduce the number of false positives by hundreds. All right. So here's what it's doing. It's this factor analysis approach is splitting the data up into the the, the differences due to sex, you can see them up here. I think these are two false positives, or maybe not. So you have the two, the two differences due to sex, then you have the batch effect here, and now you have the measurement error over here. So it breaks down the data pretty well into the different parts. All right, so, uh, wait, is that repeated? It is repeated, sorry. So this is all, we have this, we wrote a, a review on, on, on these methods. It's, it's, it was published about five years ago, maybe more. And and you can go read it. It's a, it's, a, it's described in, in in pretty in relatively simple terms, so that so that you can be aware of, of what what the problem is and some of the solutions that exist. But this is an area of, of current research. In fact, I'm I'm doing a lot of research today related to, to solving that problem in, in different technologies. Three examples listed here. If you want to see more? I have. You can follow. I, I'll announce whatever we put out on Twitter and and also uh, at some point the. The, the links go up on our web page. All right, so I want to stop there and thank some of the people that helped me with the research I described today, and of course the NIH for funding a lot of this work. Okay, that's the end. Great, thank you Dr. Zarek for this uh, wonderful start to section four for our data science seminars. And we, I think we have time for one quick question. Um, it's a little bit of a provocative question, but the question is, is really about um, sort of the natural tension that exists between exploratory data analysis and, and knowledge discovery and whether there's sort of, what, what, is, what is the sort of natural balance between discovering knowledge simply through data science and, and, and needing additional sort of confirmatory uh, analyses or experiments? Do, could you comment a little bit on that maybe? Me? Oh, sure. I. Um... So the way I work, I always work with collaborators uh, that understand the context and the substance of the, or I shouldn't say substance, but the, 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 the subject matter that we're studying. And that helps, great, greatly helps make sure that what we're finding ha makes some sense. It has some explanations that are grounded in, in, in existing knowledge. And of course, we, we definitely, we definitely uh, encourage our collaborators to to do confirmation analysis when possible. I I I'm a big I'm a big believer on confirmation and and, and on, on replication. I don't I, I like the way that that's, that's that science becomes uh, the the what's the word that's used the um the, the scientific consensus the way that that we come to it and in, in Today's in the United States today, it, it, it's not just a papers published and we believe it. It's not two papers are published and we believe it. It usually takes much more than that, and sometimes takes a group of experts uh, convened by the National Academy to sit down and like read everything that's been published, think hard, and and put out some statement. So, in general, I I I think that the person asked that question is, is worried that we just you know we explore the data and find some serendipitous result and publish it. I, 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 I don't. I don't think that's how we should do it. We should definitely collaborate with experts, and we should also confirm and look for look to future papers to see if our, our results are confirmed or not. But with that said, I, I, I am also, I'm a big uh, believer that that data exploration can lead to discovery, and can also and and also on the other side, it can also lead to the to the discovery of problems of. Of, of issues with of, with something that's been published because the data was had problems that weren't caught by the standard workflow. So I hope that answers the question. No, I think that I think that's a great answer and and certainly insightful. Um, I think looking at the body of work rather than just as a single sort of discovery is is really how science is op operates today. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. an important point that you've made. So thank you again so much for your time and for giving this talk. We're at ten o'clock. So we'll conclude here. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.